Mary Shelley. If you know one thing about Mary Shelley, it's probably that she wrote Frankenstein, a simple horror tale, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer of her day. But if you know one other thing, it's probably that she was married to Percy Shelley, who wrote complicated poems full of words like the and winged. <laughs> so how could a big name in popular culture end up with the darling of the literary set? It'd be like if Salman Rushdie started going out with Graham Norton. <laughs> One of them going, the angel emerging in this verse represents our natural spirit. And the other saying, oh, I've got a monster that's rather large and I'm afraid he's getting out of control. <laughs> but the Frankenstein we've got to know through the films is nothing like the original story, which is a tale that dealt with the questions of religion, revolution, science and sexuality. Not all of which comes across in films like Frankenstein meets Wolfman. <laughs> It's like if there was an offshoot of Schindler's List called Oscar Schindler Shrunk the Kids. <laughs> and none of this is helped, really, by Kenneth Branagh's film, which he called Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, even though it was no nearer to Shelley's story than the version with Boris Karloff. It's just an excuse for Branagh to show off. Look, I could do anger, rah, despair, ooh, love. Mm. <laughs> you might as well advertise the show as tonight. The original kinks, and when you get there, there's Branner going, all of the day and all of the night, I'll get you at night. <laughs> Mary Shelley not only wrote a fantastic story, she wrote a tale that brought together all the themes of her age, and in doing so, she invented science fiction. And most amazing of all, she wrote Frankenstein when she was 18. Which impresses me, because the only cultural statement I made at that age was to get so drunk that I walked straight past my mum and dad and was sick in the fish tank. <laughs> Mary Shelley, though, had two things in her favour that allowed her genius to flourish. The times in which she lived, and the circle that she was born into. And in particular, she was influenced by the mother that she never knew. So for a while, I'm going to talk about the writer, Mary Wollstonecraft, who was a mother, whose most famous book was... Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Now, this book was in part a reply to the Genevan philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who inspired most of the radicals who went on to lead the French Revolution. Now, Rousseau seemed to believe that women were naturally coy and passive. Men and women, he said, shouldn't be educated in the same way because each sex has its peculiar taste. Boys love sport of noise and activity, to beat the drum and to drag about their carts. Girls, on the other hand, are fond of trinkets, mirrors and dolls. <laughs> But Rousseau's attitudes towards women became even more complicated when he married a huge illiterate maid who didn't know the months of the year. <laughs> this must have led to the most fantastic surreal conversations. How can we be sure that what we perceive is actually real? I don't know. Now I've got a question for you. Have we had Christmas yet? <laughs> So Mary Wollstonecraft wrote that women were treated much the same as soldiers in an army, brought up to obey and not to question. And she took on Rousseau's argument about the girls playing with dolls. The doll will never excite attention unless confinement allows a girl no alternative. And it must make a difference that before a girl is one year old, people are buying her dolls and pink skirts covered in flowers and a pop-up DIY bikini line waxing book. <laughs> And if it's a boy, they get him a plastic machine gun called My First Ethnic Cleanser. <laughs> People see a two-year-old girl pushing her toy pram and they go, Oh, she's such a girl. It's the wheels that interest her. She's not pushing a pram thinking, I'd better get in practice. After all, I'm in the borough of Croydon, so it won't be long now. <laughs> Mary Wollstonecraft was the first to work out that a lot of the stuff we claim for young children is adults imposing their own ideas. It's like when you get these people who complain about Teletubbies saying it's not teaching proper English. The kids watching it are too. So from their perspective, learning to say Polos Kuta is an advance. Obviously it'd be different if Trevor McDonald started doing it on the news. <laughs> going, ah, Bushy wanna drop Daisy Cutter on Stan. <laughs> Poor Stan. Mary Wollstonecraft also spoke of female sexuality, and after one night, she wrote to her future husband. I have seldom seen such live fire running about my features as this morning, when recollections very dear called forth the blush of pleasure as I adjusted my hair. 
this was in a time when women were seen as little more than children unfit for proper work and with smaller brains. They weren't supposed to be sexually charged to the point of blushing with live fire as they adjusted their hair. <laughs> this was a woman whose political outlook then led her to fight for the right to be driven by her passion. Now compare that to modern politicians. I'm sure the moment that Mrs Alistair Darling knows her husband's reached the peak of passion is when he shouts, I'll respond to that in a full statement this afternoon. <laughs> The response to the vindication of the rights of women wasn't all favourable. A man called Thomas Taylor wrote a reply called Vindication of the Rights of Brutes, in which he said that if women had rights, next would be vegetables and then minerals. <laughs> Whereas the anti-Jacobin review in its index put Prostitution, see Wollstonecraft. <laughs> Mary Wollstonecraft met and fell in love with William Godwin, who had also written a radical book in support of the French Revolution called Political Justice. And Mary Wollstonecraft became pregnant by Godwin, and in 1797 she gave birth to a daughter, also called Mary. But the mother became ill, and ten days later she died, having created a life that destroyed her own. Godwin wasn't as radical as he'd been when Mary Wollstonecraft was alive, but nonetheless he built a pulpit in the living room from which he encouraged his daughters to deliver lectures on any subject. And there was something else she saw as a child that would affect her forever. It was normal for the bodies of murderers who'd been hanged at Newgate to be handed to scientists for experiments. One of her father's friends, a scientist called Anthony Carlyle, saw one of these experiments in which a vast machine comprising 240 metal plates were wired to a corpse's head. And according to Carlyle... The jaw of the deceased criminal began to quiver, and one eye actually opened. In the next experiment, the right hand was raised and clenched, and the legs and thighs were set in motion. It appeared to all bystanders that the wretched man was on the point of being restored to life. Electricity had become a central issue in the battle of ideas at the times. To radicals, it represented immense human possibilities, the triumph of science and reason. I suppose it's a sign of the difference between their times and ours, that they thought... Wow! With electricity, we can strap a corpse in a chair and bring it back to life. <laughs> and now, the leader of the free world thinks... Wow! With electricity, I can strap live people in a chair and make their skins melt. <laughs> Now, Mary's unusual education continued when she was sent to Dundee to stay in a commune in which no member was allowed to accumulate wealth for themselves. And while Mary was at this commune, Percy Shelley had started writing to Mary's dad, Godwin, and he wanted to use the inheritance from his father and grandfather to pay Godwin to write more political pamphlets. But the first problem he had was that his father and grandfather were still alive. <laughs> And now Shelley arranged a loan on the agreement that he'd repay it four times over as soon as his father and grandfather died and he got his inheritance. Imagine doing that now. You'd get a phone call every other day from a call centre. Hello, Mr Shelley. It's Tina here from Abbey National. Is your dad dead yet? <laughs> Percy was 21 and married to Harriet, but his next problem arose when he came to visit Godwin. And Mary, who was now 16, was back from Dundee, and Percy was immediately captivated by her enthusiasm for science and the French Revolution. And one day, they went for a walk by her mother's grave in St Pancras. And it seems that that is where Percy announced his love for Mary and where they made love for the first time. Now, I know it can be tough when you're young and in love with nowhere to go, but call me old-fashioned. <laughs> On your mother's grave! <laughs> Percy loved her because she was one of the only people who could debate with him at his level. And in Shelley's day, divorce was almost impossible. It cost £1,000, it could only be applied for by the man, and it had to be approved by Parliament. Percy's wife Harriet wouldn't agree to a legal separation, so Percy and Mary discussed joint suicide, which was disturbed when Mrs Godwin burst into Mary's room to discover Percy with a gun, urging Mary to drink a bottle of laudanum, at which point he would shoot himself. <laughs> And I bet Mary's greatest anxiety then was going, Oh no, me mum's caught me committing suicide, she'll kill me. <laughs> so one night at four in the morning, Mary and her half-sister Claire climbed out of her bedroom window and ran away to France with Percy on a fisherman's boat. Now this would have seemed outrageous enough, even if Mary hadn't just been 16. But to leg it with a girl of 16 when he was already married... Percy was lucky he wasn't brought back on the next boat with a crowd swimming alongside, whipped up by the Daily Express, rocking the ferry, shouting, You're scum! <laughs> 
to continue on their travels, they bought a donkey and the three set off for Switzerland, walking while the donkey carried their bags. But the donkey broke down and they had to trade it in for a mule. <laughs> so there's something that's never changed. I bet when they went to trade it in, they probably went, oh, look at this, it's two old donkeys welded together. <laughs> Eventually it became apparent that they weren't going to be able to live together forever in Switzerland with no money and a mule. So they headed back towards England on a boat up the Rhine and on Mary's 17th birthday they stopped at a ruined castle of a noble family, the Frankensteins. By the time they got back to England they had no money at all so to get home they blagged a rowing boat and rowed it up the Thames. <laughs> they moved in together in London but all society was disgusted by their behaviour and they had to move house every few weeks and meet each other in disguise at pre-arranged points as they were being chased by bailiffs. And even Godwin started legal proceedings against Percy for the money that had been promised for writing. But also Mary had been pregnant, as was Percy's wife, Harriet. But Mary's baby was born prematurely and didn't survive. And six days later she wrote in her diary... Dreamed that my little baby came to life again. It had only been cold and we rubbed it by the fire and it lived. Following all this disaster, Mary moved to Bristol to get out of the way of people who thought that this served her right. And it seems that... While there, she went through another experience that shaped the book that changed her life. She saw a prominent surgeon called William Lawrence, but found him abhorrent because he argued that African people were midway between humans and monkeys. And though slavery had been abolished, there were thousands of ex-slaves living in Bristol who were treated as subhuman. Mary's brush with the attitudes of empire left her fascinated and yet horrified by the way in which human beings could judge other people to be undeserving of humanity just because they looked different. Claire suggested a trip to Geneva for her, Byron, Mary and Percy. Now this is often portrayed as a drug-crazed degenerate celebs holiday, but the main attraction for all of them was to be able to spend the time writing and discussing radical ideas. Byron was leaving England because he'd been rejected by the establishment for supporting Napoleon. All of them were in despair at how Britain had become a police state, which isn't quite what you'd expect if the trip was just drug-crazed. I doubt whether you'd get Sean Ryder and Ozzy Osbourne going, Here, yeah, where's that pamphlet I were writing on the regeneration of social democracy? <laughs> Sorry, mate, I used it as a rudge. <laughs> There's such hypocrisy about drugs, it's ridiculous anyway. And you'd expect it a little bit from the last government. The Tories were all about 70. But this lot, New Labour, they're all in their 50s. And they go, no, I never took drugs at all, never ever. You liars! <laughs> and then every now and again they get one of them to come out and say, well, I did try it once, but I didn't like it. You liar! <laughs> what the rubbish! Anyone who tried it once and didn't, if you tried it once and didn't like it, you went and tried a different one. <laughs> so, oh, I'm never having that again. What if you tried a piece of pie and never like? I'm never eating food again. I didn't like. <laughs> When's one of them going to be honest and go on the Frost program and say, "Did I ever take drugs? Did I?" <laughs> I'll tell you what, Sir David. Did you ever try the hot knives with the bottom cut out of the milk bottle? I thought my lungs were going to burst. <laughs> anyway, back to the European single currency. <laughs> Now, one night in Geneva, during a storm, with or without drugs, Byron suggested that everybody should write a ghost story. And that night, Mary had a dream about one of the experiments with electricity that she'd heard about, in which Dr Erasmus Darwin had shot so many volts through a string of dough that it carried on wriggling for some time on its own. She lay awake all night, considering the implications of what would happen if the science so revered by radicals came to dominate every aspect of life, even creation. And the next day she wrote a story, a few pages long, but Percy urged her to develop it into a complete book, and eventually she wrote Frankenstein. Now, thousands of academics since then have debated the issue, what is it about? So you get stuff like... A sense of persecution represents the fearful, phantasmic rejection by recasting of an original homosexual desire, making sense to think of Frankenstein as embodying strongly homophobic mechanisms. <laughs> it's about a bloody monster, you pretentious tosser! <laughs> These people could watch the Teletubbies and go, Lala's search for the ball indicates an unhappiness with the size of his own genitals. <laughs> 
first answer to what is Frankenstein about is it's about what it says it's about. It wasn't written in code, so if Mary had wanted it to be about something else, she'd have written something else. If someone leaves a post-it note saying, please take out the rubbish, you don't go, hmm, what he's really saying is smear marmite all over the cushions. <laughs> but you can ask, what were the ideas in society that influenced the story? Now, the book starts with letters from a Captain Walton, who's on a ship that's trapped as it searches for the North Pole. And straight away, he expresses themes of a revolutionary age. He describes how, as he was planning his trip to the North Pole... I devoted my nights to the study of mathematics, the theory of medicine, and branches of physical science. And in order that there could be no doubting his modern spirit, he says... My father made a kite with a wire and string which drew down electricity from the clouds. And Benjamin Franklin, who'd invented this electric kite in real life, wasn't just any inventor. He'd been presented to the French Revolutionary Assembly as an all-time hero. But mixed with this is a splendid Englishness. So when Dr Frankenstein arrives at Walton's boat, emaciated and frozen on a sledge, he tells Walton how he had dreamed of creating life and how he'd robbed graves to get the parts and spent years piecing them together. And that's what must have taken all the time. He was probably sat there surrounded by bits looking at a set of instructions that went, rejoin connecting nostril A to circular upper nasal vein F. There isn't a nasal vein F. <laughs> oh, now this bit's in bloody Spanish. <laughs> and then comes the famous bit that begins... It was a cold, dreary night in November. When the creature comes to life. There was an obvious influence from Mary's life in this part of the story. Victor recoils in horror at the man he's created and runs off until he falls asleep, where he says, I dreamed I held the corpse of my dead mother in my arms. And so the creature runs off through a village where everyone goes berserk because he looks so hideous. And even then, far from destroying things, the creature finds a peasant family and he hides in their barn. And at night, he tours the area to gather food for them. The creature's first instinct, though, was to socialise and become educated. For a year, he hid in the barn, picking up language as he heard it, slowly learning to speak, learning to read Milton and Shakespeare and books on maths and geography that happens to be lying about, as they are in any barn. <laughs> and he was appalled at certain human values. I learnt that the possessions most esteemed by your fellow creatures were high rank and riches. A man might be respected with only one of these advantages, but without either he was considered a vagabond and slave, doomed to waste his powers for the profits of a chosen few. The head of the family was a blind man who played the flute. The creature decided to wait for a moment when the blind man was on his own and then introduce himself, in the hope that because he wouldn't be frightened by the creature's appearance, the blind man would offer him refuge. So he's lucky it didn't turn out to be David Blunkett. <laughs> For a few moments, the creature's strategy worked and the blind man accepted him, impressed at how intelligent he appeared. He was lucky he'd found the right books to learn from in that barn, though, and he was more likely the literature in a village barn would be a pile of porn mags. <laughs> and then the creature would have gone, Right, now to impress him with my knowledge. Next week, eight pages of serious girl-on-girl -girl action. <laughs> But then the family returned, and as soon as they saw him, they attacked him with a stick. And he decided that he could never be part of society. And from then on, it all went wrong. The family moved away in fear of the creature. And then he tried to rescue a girl, but the girl's brother shot him in the arm. And at that point, he decided to wreak vengeance on mankind, especially on his creator, by murdering the people closest to Dr. Frankenstein, starting with his young brother. So the story has achieved something remarkable here in that it's made the reader look at the creature's background in order to understand what made him become the murderer of a child. Whereas if it was written now, it would just go... Once upon a time there was a monster who killed a boy because he was scum. I don't call these monsters monsters, I call them scum. Because I care more than anyone else. The end. <laughs> because murderers have become celebrities, the same as Big Brother contestants. Nothing would please the press more than a Big Brother special with Harold Shipman, Dennis Nielsen, Rose West and Myra Hindley in the house together. <laughs> who gets buried under the patio on Friday night? You'll decide. <laughs> 
Even after he murders the boy, the creature meets Frankenstein to offer a truce, as long as the doctor creates a mate for him. And when Frankenstein eventually refuses, the creature kills Frankenstein's best friend, and he then kills the woman that Frankenstein was due to marry. Now, the implication of the creature's behaviour is that no matter how appalling someone's actions, there must be a reason for them. And unless you can trace that reason, you'll never be able to stop them. Just increasing the punishment doesn't affect a psycho. Some nutter's not going to be about to put someone's head in a fridge and then think, hang on, or is this against the law? <laughs> Throughout this story, then, are the themes and debates of the time. The relationship between creator and created must owe something to Mary's feelings towards the mother who died giving birth to her. There was the fascination and dangers of science, of the notions of society, and the horrors of judging people on their appearance, as Mary had seen people do with ex-slaves. And then Frankenstein chases the creature to the North Pole and meets Walton. Even then, you feel sorry for the creature. And this idea is so powerful that it even comes across in the Boris Karloff film, which, to be honest, isn't very much like the book. For example, when Frankenstein needs his body parts, he sends his assistant to a science lab, and the assistant drops a jar that has normal brain written on it in felt pen. <laughs> so he picks up another one that's got abnormal brain <laughs> written on it instead. Is that how they label things in science labs? <laughs> on the little post-it note saying, Atom, careful not to split. <laughs> any child that sees even that film identifies with the creature. And this, along with all the social themes of the book, made it not a horror story, but the first science fiction story. This didn't necessarily make it popular with the establishment. And the review of Frankenstein ended... The doubt is whether the head or the heart of the author be the most diseased. But by the time the reviews came out, they were the least of Mary's worries. As she was writing Frankenstein, Claire had become pregnant with Byron's child. And then Mary and Percy moved to Marlow in Buckinghamshire, where they heard that Mary's other sister, Fanny, had committed suicide. And then Percy's first wife, Harriet, committed suicide as well. And her family fought Percy for custody of their two children, with Harriet's family winning because Percy was an atheist. So apart from all the tragedy involved, they must have thought they were living through an episode of Brookside. <laughs> Except then a week later, they'd be all right again. Hey, how are you keeping, Percy Bish? All right, Terry. I'm over my problems and back on the poetry round now. <laughs> After Harriet's suicide, there was pressure from all quarters for Percy and Mary to get married. The most relentless pressure came from Mary's father, Godwin, who'd originally written so much about marriage being a tomb of love, and Percy and Mary did eventually get married. By then, she'd had another child, William, and soon after another one, Clara. But Clara didn't live very long. And Mary then sank into a depression that she probably never came out of, and she can't have been helped by the letter that she got from her father. You should recognise that it is only persons of a very ordinary sort that sink long under a calamity of this nature. Mary had even more problems, as Percy was clearly falling in love with her half-sister, Claire. Percy wrote her a poem describing his thoughts of her each night that went to nurse the image of unfelt caresses till dim imagination just possesses. But Percy seemed so convinced of his own free love theories that he was slightly confused as to why his wife was all that bothered about this. The trouble is, it's hard to make that work in the real world. Is there really a relationship that could go... Hello, darling. Nice day today? Not bad, dear. Screwed the window cleaner as it happens. Oh, did you really, darling? Well, he's done a good job. Of the windows, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> And then in 1819, the three-year-old son, William, caught a disease called Roman fever, and he died. Mary did have a fourth child, Percy Florence, who did live to an old age. But her next disaster came when her husband, Percy, set off in his boat to meet a friend in Italy, despite the storms. Now, although Percy couldn't swim, he was fairly confident about his abilities on the sea, having said, I can steer a boat with one hand and read a book by Plato with the other. Which is Andy. <laughs> You end up upside down, crashing against a rock, but at least you can be sure you're really there. <laughs> Percy did end up upside down, crashing against a rock, and he was eventually found when his body was washed up by the shore, and his friends, including Byron, gave him a ceremonial cremation on the beach. One obituary said, Shelley, the writer of infidel poetry, has drowned. Now he knows whether there is a god or not. <laughs> From then on, the last of Mary's spirit seemed to have sat. But not quite. 
She publicly supported the Young Italy movement, she kept in touch with radical painters, and she went to Napoleon's funeral. And she did write several more novels, although this was mostly because Percy's father cut off the inheritance. But her revolutionary spirit was broken by the string of disasters she'd experienced. Not that there's necessarily a direct link between a writer's personality and their ability to write. I mean, look at Geoffrey Archer. Here's a man who comes up with fantastic works of fiction, then as soon as he tries to write it in a book, the ability deserts him. <laughs> As time went on, Mary lost all contact with radical ideas. She became a fan of Disraeli, and then she condemned the 1848 revolutions across Europe, but she never fell out of love with Percy. In one letter, a reply to someone asking if she would marry again, she wrote, Never. Mary Shelley shall be written on my tomb. Why? I cannot tell, except that it is so pretty a name, I shall never have the heart to get rid of it. And that's what happened when, in 1851, she died. She'd wanted to be buried by her mother in St Pancras, under the ground where she'd first made love to Percy. It'd be lovely if we could all end up with a gesture like that, I think, though in a few years' time it would mean a lot of digging up of the toilets in Caxton House Block in Swanley School. <laughs> Jane, who had married Mary's son Percy, saw the decay the area had fallen into and decided to have her parents' bodies exhumed and buried, along with Mary, in a cemetery in Bournemouth. But the rector refused to allow such heathens in his cemetery, so Jane turned up at the gates with the three bodies in a hearse and announced that she was staying until she could bury them, and then the rector gave in. Even then, the rector refused to allow the word Frankenstein on her tombstone, or even to be spoken at the memorial a decision that was still upheld by the rector of this church in Bournemouth in 1977. <laughs> so as the rest of the establishment was panicking about punk, in Bournemouth they were trying to hold back the 1830s. <laughs> Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein because she was an enthusiastic, passionate participant of the great debates of her age. For a woman to express ideas at all showed immense courage. If she wrote Frankenstein today, it'd probably only get printed if it started... November. A cold, dreary day. I've created a monster. Me! I'm literally pouring out of my size 10 dress. I'm 32 and still no sign of marrying a tedious posh tosspot in publishing. <laughs> The greater our knowledge of science and astronomy becomes, the more our imagination seems to vanish and we seem to think that everywhere must only be the same as it is now here today. I saw this bit on The Next Generation, set in the year 3500 or something, and this woman on the spaceship said, I've got to stay really focused on this project. <laughs> So it's 1,500 years' time and we're nipping across galaxies, but we're still using poxy American phrases that no one had ever said before 1994. I suppose we'd all be going, I'm so not going to that black hole. <laughs> like the captain said, concentrated collapse mass will be fun, as if. I'm like, so don't even go there, Star Commander. <laughs>